All right, guys. Future Man 19 here. Strange times we are living in. Am I right? The seven-year tribulation period is drawing to a close. It's time to put our pencils down because the test is almost over. The test where we will be given a reward according to our works. It is almost too late for or the unrepentant, the liars, and, and the mockers, the sinners, and scoffers. But I want us to forget about the world for a moment, because the world is already lost, and we can't save it, no matter how much we want to, because it was not meant to be saved. The Creator has another plan for us, and it's called the harvest. Yea, even the harvest draweth nigh. So there's no use in even talking about this lost planet any longer. Let's focus on ourselves and our own enlightenment, shall we? Because what can be more important than the harvest, an event that occurs only once in a full universal cycle? But first, I would like to talk about Christ. Because Christ plays a vital part in our salvation and enlightenment, there is no other way to receive salvation yet through Jesus Christ. You see, when Christ came, he struck a deal with God the Father. Since Christ had committed no sin but still forgave those who transgressed against him, he ultimately created a paradox. Christ asked his Father, Father, knowing I am thy Son, having created no sin, to offer myself up as a reconciliation between thee and those who believe on my name. Will you forgive them as I have forgiven those who have wronged me? And the Father, seeing such sacrifice from his only begotten, was moved towards compassion. The Father, knowing the price for sin was eternal pain and anguish, became so completely moved by his blameless Son, who had taken up the sins of the world upon his already perfect soul, would have to face punishment for carrying them. But the Father, also being a just and holy God, thought how could this perfect being face punishment if he never knew any sin? That he never wronged anyone or ever did a bad thing. This created a paradox. God was met with a conundrum. Either God had to punish a blameless and spotless person for the sins that were ultimately not his, or change the rules and offer a new path, a new way in dealing with sin. This way was Christ's way, and it was called forgiveness. You see, before Christ came, the Jews still followed Moses' law, which was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And the only way to wash away one's sin was to offer a sacrifice on the altar. But Christ changed the way. This is why they ultimately killed him. They just couldn't believe that there could be any other way. And how could this man called Jesus of Nazareth figure it out before them? Christ created a new universal law that even the Creator, and thus the creation, would have to follow, bending in reverence to the holiest man to have ever lived. And what was Christ's only rule, the only commandment that he gave to us? To love one another as I have loved you. Love is the new world that is waiting for us. This is what R.A. from the Law of One calls 4D. This is what Christ was referring to when he said, My kingdom is not of this world, in my Father's house are many dimensions. Christ knew that this world would be ending. This is why on his return he promised that the world would be scorched through his righteous judgment, and then in a blink of an eye we will all be transfigured, leaving this world behind and moving on to the next level. This is the harvest that has been spoken about through every culture that has ever existed. I had to explain why Christ is such an important figure in our path towards enlightenment, that there is actual real power behind his name which I will go into on another lesson. Anyways, I would like to continue with what I was going to say. You know the age-old saying that goes, Ignorance is bliss. I have never believed that. In my pursuit of truth, I have never found myself more happy. I believe finding truth brings about an ultimate joy once it is discovered, because it is a literal peeling away of the veil that gives us a glimpse into our own divinity. Look at the world we see today. Everyone is either lying or falling for the lies. And at the end of the day, what's the difference? Tell me, what is the difference between believing in a lie or telling it? Because I see no difference. Both have the same consequences. And if you believe in a lie, then it is your own fault. You have stumbled off the path towards truth. 
you are the one who is ultimately responsible for your own thoughts and choices. And if you don't admit your mistake in believing in the lie, then you have essentially doubled down on your own ignorance. It's easy to forgive someone who has admitted their mistake and then repented of it. This is why repentance is a true principle of the universe. Repentance brings about balance. And balance is what the universe constantly seeks. It is what the adept seeks. Now, I want to begin diving deeper into more hidden esoteric knowledge. I want you all to become magicians to start affecting the matrix that is all around you because it can be affected through our will alone. Because everything is consciousness. And when you are able to tap into that infinite source of consciousness, realizing that you are also a part of it, then you are able to shift it using willpower. And with enough of us doing it, we can easily change the world for the betterment of all. All that is needed to reach critical mass is 144,000 souls, as stated in the book of Revelation. Those are Fibonacci numbers, and there is a reason for that. But before we begin our journey through the darkness and into the light, I want to talk with you about how easily it is to become manipulated. In our world full of shadows, this is happening at a very alarming rate. It's actually very common for people to become manipulated or to manipulate another person. Just look around you. Most are fast asleep. Most are NPCs that can be programmed by simply watching what's on TV or from social media, taking it in as if it's the gospel truth. This is why TV shows are called programs, and why social engineers, celebrities, and social influencers are paid big money to influence your thoughts. And the main reason why this is happening is because the more that we stray away from God and His principles, the more we look to our flawed reality with its flawed people for the answers. God shows us the truth by his creation. Nature has always shown us the way. Yet, as a species, we strive more and more towards an artificial reality. Another big reason why people are easily manipulated is because of their inherent fear of being wrong. If you grew up inside a government-sanctioned classroom like I did, and I know most of you have, then you would know how this fear was built into us starting at a very young age. Being wrong in school meant that you scored poorly, and if you scored poorly, you were told that you would have little to no success in life. This kind of conditioning has lasted with us all of our lives. This is why you must go into a deep meditation and confront all of your childhood trauma. Because let me tell you, you might not think that there is, but there are decades of stored up trauma within your mind and body right now. I have been able to walk through my memories to reveal my past trauma and to ultimately accept and forgive it. That is what we must do in order to heal our past, which also heals our future. This is a lesson that will have to be taught in a different video. Another reason why a lot of people are manipulated is because the most popular answer is also the easiest one to follow. No one ever asks or questions the status quo. No one ever wonders why things are the way that they are. When I was growing up, I was constantly reminded that life wasn't fair and that's just the way things are. But I never believed that. I wholeheartedly believe that things could be changed and be changed for the better, not in the upside down clown commie way that's currently going on, where we are forcing everyone to either be equally poor or equally dumbed down, all in the name of equality. Equality is what the devil always wanted, that way we would never have to be judged for our sins again doing whatever we wanted with a thought of consequence. But I want a world where... If we change our way of thinking, we can create win-win scenarios for all based on our own merits, not by simply exchanging our time for money, but where our hard work and effort would pay off, and not in the capitalist sense either, but in a way where all of society would benefit at the same time. This world is possible. So let's try and get rid of this dog-eat-dog -dog world, where there always has to be a loser and a winner. Instead of competition, let's have more cooperation. I believe we are headed there. 
Bitcoin is a sign that the world is changing in that sense. I always say that in today's world, if the thing you are following is popular, then it is most likely a PSYOP. A PSYOP is a psychological operation that comes in a form of social engineering. A PSYOP can be as simple as a 30 second TikTok video or a social media post you read on Twitter. This is an illogical line of thinking that most people don't even realize that they are doing. A lot of times people will just see a post that has a bunch of likes and will automatically accept that as the truth. Or they will see a social influencer or celebrity saying something that on the surface level seems correct, but after some careful examination will most likely be false. This logical fallacy is called an appeal to popularity fallacy, also known as the ad populum fallacy. It is a fallacy that occurs when someone claims something is true just because many people believe it. This fallacy is based on the idea that the majority opinion must be true because the majority believes in it. In this way, especially on the internet, opinions can be Sybil attacked. Remember, the internet's algorithm is designed to feed you certain information to curb your mindset in the way that they want. So what is a Sybil attack? A Sybil attack involves an attacker who creates multiple fake identities to gain an unfair amount of influence over a system. The attacker's goal is to trick others into believing that the fake identities are legitimate users. In this way, what some people call botting, there are those who can manipulate others by swaying their opinion into following the more false, popular opinion. Because it is generally hard to verify how many likes are legitimate or simply fake accounts that are fluffing up the numbers to appear more popular. Our mainstream media loves using this method, which is why you can always hear the exact same talking points being televised on every single network at the same time. They are very good at this, but when you step back and do your own research, you will also notice how obvious they are. Another method that mainstream media especially likes to use is a constant repetition of the same talking point. For instance, if they keep talking about, say, January 6th as an insurrection, repeating it over and over ad nauseum, hoping that it eventually sticks in your head, kind of like when you listen to a song over and over on repeat, it eventually gets stuck in there. Right now, the media is using the term weird to describe the Republican Party. If enough people are saying it, then it must be true. Those who believe in the greater good notion will also fall for the greater opinion notion because the truth to them is whatever the established opinion at that time is presented as the main talking point. Thus, their opinion can change on a dime as long as the establishment's trusted sources are regurgitating it ad nauseum these are just a few examples of how they can psyop you and how they are social engineering the masses. If you want to learn how to defend against these kinds of attacks, research more about logical fallacies. It's a good starting point. Because recognizing these kinds of arguments that flawed people have, you will begin to understand how people will use them to argue their points and thus are able to defend against it. You will also start recognizing that the more enlightened people will not fall for these kinds of tricks either. These are some low-level psyops that happen every day, but are very effective in keeping most of the population under their control. Remember, control is their ultimate goal. They want control over your body, your mind, and finally your soul. They believe, for the most part, that we are all mostly stupid, and I would have to agree with them to a certain point. But it is not that we are all inherently stupid, it's just that most of us keep falling for these logical fallacies. Instead of doing our own research, we'll believe the lie because it takes more effort to find the truth. And that's what the most important thing that I want to teach you today, is that you have to start taking accountability for your own salvation and responsibility for your own enlightenment. You have to start holding yourself accountable for the things that you believe in. And I get it. There are just so many lies out there that it becomes very difficult to navigate through it all. But I want to give you some tools to get you started on your way. You have to start thinking in levels. There are levels to everything. There are infinite levels of truth. There are even levels to the amount of lies they tell. 
and navigating through the lies is the first test. If you are able to navigate through them, like in a video game, you level up, and we must constantly level up in order to achieve enlightenment. In the Law of One, R.A. states that the power of which you speak is a spiritual power. The powers of the mind as such do not encompass such works as these. You may, with some fruitfulness, consider the possibilities of moonlight. You are aware that we have described the matrix of the spirit as a night. The moonlight, then, offers either a true picture seen in shadow or chimera and falsity. The power of falsity is deep, as is the power to discern truth from shadow. The shadow of hidden things is an infinite depth in which is stored the power of the one infinite creator. The adept, then, is working with the power of hidden things illuminated by that which can be false or true, to embrace falsity, to know it, to seek it, and to use it, gives a power that is most great. This is the nature of the power of your visitor, and may shed some light upon the power of one who seeks in order to serve others as well. For the missteps in the night are oh so easy. Now you have to start at rock bottom and begin from there. This might seem counterintuitive, but it always reminds me of a Bruce Lee saying when trying to teach one of his disciples, asks his disciple to empty his cup so that he may fill it. Essentially, emptying all thoughts, beliefs, and opinions opens up your mind to receive new knowledge. This is why many enlightened beings start out with meditation. Meditation helps reset our focus. It helps by eliminating the troublesome parts of your psyche that don't really belong to you, parts that you don't even really need, but have become familiar to you. This is what many in the spiritual community call the ego, and why they say that all must go through an ego death in order to become reborn. This might also be what Jesus Christ was alluding to when he talked about becoming reborn, that becoming a new person is essential to entering into this new kingdom of thought. I have used meditation repeatedly to break apart parts of myself, keeping the parts that were needed while getting rid of the rest. I essentially had multiple ego deaths over the course of more than a decade I saw myself die every day, meaning that I could start every day as a blank slate, a new canvas to draw my personality from, an empty vessel to receive knowledge from a source beyond the veil, a way to draw on the power of the universal archetypes. Switching archetypes at will is a high-level power that adepts can use to adapt to any situation, a powerful lesson that will have to be reserved for a later video. Meditation is also a great way to start verifying your own beliefs because it is a way to step back and really view yourself from an outside perspective, like looking into a mirror, but a mirror for your mind. Because while in meditation, you start to see your own thoughts as if they were foreign objects floating around in your headspace. And if you are able to confront each one of them, to verify them, by contemplating the antithesis of each of those thoughts, then you will have learned a new method in how to balance one's own thoughts. It takes a lot of humility to be able to change one's own beliefs. Humility is a powerful tool indeed in the spiritual process. It almost seems counterintuitive to figuratively put yourself in another's shoes by objectively taking each thought or belief that you have and playing devil's advocate to it. But I have done this with all of my beliefs. And this is how I can verify if I am believing in a lie, a manipulation, or if this belief is not based on any kind of facts, because facts help establish the foundation to truth. I have heard that there's been studies on if people have an internal dialogue or not, and they say that only about 30% of the world has any kind of internal dialogue with themselves. That means that 70% of people around the world are more susceptible to thought manipulation tactics and psyops. Because how would they be able to verify their own thoughts if they can't even have a conversation with themselves, which is why billions ended up taking the mark of the beast when it was offered to them. It's an extremely frightening thought to think that most of these people's thoughts, opinions and beliefs come from somewhere else other than their own brain where literally billions of people are walking around acting like NPCs in a video game. Like, wow, 
just think about that for a second. This also means that if you are one who is able to hold an internal dialogue, and especially if you are watching this video, then you are more capable of walking the path of an adept, thus becoming a player in your own game. So I hope you are glad that you are here right now and listening to this video. Look, we all build figurative Tower of Babels inside our own minds all the time. We all have very strong beliefs that we are just not ready to give up, even if the facts tell us how wrong we are about having those beliefs. Most are still willing to die on a hill for them, even blow themselves up for it. Now it took me a long time to destroy the tower that was built up inside my mind, and I know it will be for you too, especially if you hold steadfast to your beliefs. But if your beliefs are really true, then holding them up to the light shouldn't be a problem, right? And if you are really committed to finding out the truth, and when you find your beliefs to be wrong, humility is the key ingredient for changing them, because no one is perfect. But staying loyal to your beliefs can be a very dangerous thing. I mean, look around. The world is the way it is because people would rather stay loyal to their beliefs than loyal to the truth. Which is why finding truth's foundation is so important here. Okay, now what is the foundation for truth, and how do we find it? First we need to break down the walls inside our head. Meditation can be a very effective tool for this, because meditation can start you out as a blank slate where the foundation can begin to become laid out. So once we get to this blank slate, what becomes its foundation? What is the foundation we pour over our minds? Now what I can tell you, and what most of the ancient philosophers would agree with me on, is how mathematics can be the best foundation for finding truth. Because mathematics answers the how to every question imaginable. Mathematics can explain everything in the most simplest of terms, which is why basically all of the most famous philosophers the world has ever known had all started out as mathematicians. Galileo, who many call the father of all science, even the greatest philosopher of all time, said that mathematics is the language of God. I have a video that I made previously called Proof of God Found in Everything. I explain in that video how mathematics can actually prove that there is a God, that there is a universal infinite creator that can be found in literally everything. This video is about three hours long, so I don't want to go too much into it in this video, but if you really want a deep dive into the subject, I suggest that you watch that video on my channel. I'll even link it under this video's description. Anyways, let's continue. I always say that if you want to speak to God and hear His voice, then you must know His language first. When most people think of math, they think of all those boring hours sitting in school learning geometry and algebra. Now that's not the kind of math that I'm talking about, because math can correspond to all sorts of subjects. I honestly believe that math can link together every subject. And another great thing about math is that it doesn't rely on faith in order to believe it, and it does not need your belief in order for it to be true. Math can truly stand on its own merit. Faith is a strong belief in something that generally cannot be proven. It is what most people rely on in order to affirm their own beliefs. Like. If you ask someone who just came out of a church why they believe in God, their response will most likely be based on some sort of faith answer. But what if I told you that you do not need to believe in God or hold any kind of belief anymore? That you could know for 100% certainty that there is a God and that there is actual mathematical proof of his existence? Every problem has a solution, every question an answer, and what better than using mathematics to come up with these solutions and to answer your every problem? Math is easily verifiable and almost impossible to refute. When the math is sound, then there is no question about it. Math proofs are what is generally considered to be a legitimate, full-proof fact. Scientists often back up their science by using math to verify their research. Bitcoin also uses math to secure its network. There is no doubt that math is a very solid foundation for establishing truth. So you might still be thinking, but why is mathematics considered to be God's language? Why did Galileo say this? How does that make any sense? Well, let's think like an architect for a second, because God's the greatest architect, yeah? So think about how God built the universe. 
Do you think he just randomly threw everything together and hoped that it would work? Or like an architect, did he sit and plan and measure everything out by making a blueprint? I'm sure God could have snapped his fingers and everything came into being, but if God was this super intelligent being, then the universe would also have to be super intelligently built, correct? That sounds logical. And do you think geometry was kept in mind while creating the universe, geometry being another form of math? Could this be why there are shapes we call sacred that are used as the building blocks for the entire world and universe? If these shapes were the basis for all of creation, then how better to know our Creator than by learning about His creation? This might be why the ancient philosophers thought of all these shapes as sacred. And of course, I am talking about the Platonic solids here. It is said that nobody has ever seen God but look around you. Can you not see the exquisite marksmanship of His hands? Do you not see the beauty? and the divinity of his work? Are you not moved daily by the perfection and order of it all? The world literally sings praises to its creator all day, every day. If only you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear it. In the Bible it states, and the Spirit of God moved, which marked the beginning point of creation. Movement implies vibration and sound. What did Tesla say about vibration again? Tesla said that if you want to know the secrets of creation, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And these three concepts can all be explained by math. And after searching along this path, you will be that much closer to speaking God's language and knowing what God knows. Because isn't that what we all want? Even the self-proclaimed atheists want to know the secrets of the universe, but they will never find it without first humbling themselves before the creator of it. The reason why I tell you these things is because I can't break down your mind for you. I can't destroy your ego for you. I can't tell you what is a lie or not. It is your own responsibility to figure these things out. I'm only teaching you the methods on how I got there. Anyways, I think that's all the lesson that is needed for you today. To finish it off, I would like to read you another passage from the Law of One. The space, time, and time-space concepts are those concepts describing as mathematically as possible the relationships of your illusion, that which is seen to that which is unseen. These descriptive terms are clumsy. They, however, suffice for this work. In the experiences of the mystical search for unity, these need never be considered, for they are but part of an illusory system. The seeker seeks the one. This one is to be sought, as we have said, by the balanced and self-accepting self, aware both of its apparent distortions and its total perfection. Resting in this balanced awareness, the entity then opens the self to the universe which it is. The light energy of all things may then be attracted by this intense seeking, and wherever the inner seeking meets the attracted cosmic prana, realization of the one takes place. The purpose of clearing each energy center is to allow that meeting place to occur at the indigo ray vibration, thus making contact with intelligent infinity and dissolving all illusions. Service to others is automatic at the released energy generated by this state of consciousness.